Today, I'm welcoming Chip Chipman, who, together with his wife Jan, was directly mentored by Sydney Banks. He's been a huge influence on my own coach and mentor, Jamie Smart. Chip and Jan have worked in areas as diverse as corporate coaching and coaching of prisoners, and they work extensively with addiction rehab, which I think you're doing at the moment, aren't you? Is that right? Uh, no, not at the moment. Oh, not uh, at the moment. Okay. We have some individuals where that's the subject matter, but not as a, not the way we were when we were doing oh, okay. locations. Yeah. So I wanted to start by asking you, um, can you tell us something about what you learned from your friendship with Sid? Uh, now that's a really broad question. So I know. <laughs> You know, the thing I learned the most is kind of hard to describe in the sense that I, I learned to listen to myself. Right. You know, um, one thing about Sid and our time together, um, he would never accept responsibility for us feeling better or changing or he, he refused. Whenever we would tell him, oh, I had this insight and I feel better or I've managed to just stop that negative part of my life. And when I want to thank you, he would say, no, no. He said, my only, he would say quite often, my only job was to point to the door. Your job was to walk through it. So you have to give yourself credit. And that's, that stayed with me for many, it still is because it, it's later on, we can talk about our work and our coaching, but that's really at the heart of it is mm -hmm. that yeah, we're not responsible for changing anybody. The only thing we're responsible about is telling our story and pointing to that very same door that Sid talked about. All right. Yeah. So I guess then following on from that, what would you say is unique about the way you coach? Well, for one thing, it, it's hard to describe in the sense that there's no technique model or specific method with our, with my work, with Jan's work. Okay. Uh, the heart of it is hoping for a deep level of rapport with whatever individual or group we're talking with and listening at a deep enough level to have a real sense of who and what they are. And in the early days, Sid would often say, don't talk to the mask, talk to the person behind the mask. Yeah. And he said, he would say, if you do that honestly and deeply, that's eventually who will talk back. And so our work revolves around that idea that everybody that we work with has the same wisdom that we have or Sid had. Everybody has that wisdom within them. Mm -hmm. they, they may not have realized it. They may be caught up in their thinking. They may be lost in certain uh, parts of life, like when we work with people with addictions, for instance. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it's not in there. So how that works out on a practical level we worked with many addiction centers through the years, um, major programs with hundreds of people. Yeah. And we never talked about addictions. It never came up in our class. Sometimes a question would be asked, but we didn't bring it up. Right. We would talk about who and what people were on the inside. Right? And as we talked about that and gave examples through our experience with Sid and our experience with our own lives, people would start to have insights right? They would begin to see that they have something within, that they weren't broken. Right? right. And that would take care of the issue of addictions or being in prison or being an angry executive. <laughs> in that sense, it really didn't matter. But that's really at the heart of our work is a matter of really listening and then talking from the heart. And I've said many times in my talks that the only authority anybody has to talk about these principles is their personal experience with them. Everything else is intellectual. It's not without value because, you know, we can learn some basic things, but what moves people, uh, Sid used to use the term, it's a Hawaiian term, he would say, talk story. Always uh -huh. talk story, right? Uh, because in stories, it's like if I, if I try to give somebody a philosophy or a belief system or represent the principles in that way, then I get the response you would always get is, do I believe that? Do I like that? Does that fit with my current beliefs? You know, you're, you're into an intellectual back and forth. On the other hand, if you tell a story from the heart of how you were moved and how you changed, people just identify with the story and with their own situation without 
being forced to accept or reject any particular belief, right? So that leaves it open for them to have their own insights, you know, to see something for themselves in the moment. And it's really interesting because sometimes I, I get requests, you know, recommend, would you recommend this class or that class or whatever? And I say, well, you know, what's available to everybody without exception, right? Is exactly what was available to Jan and I even 45 years ago. Uh, and that is a direct insight from Sid, like his recordings and his books, he's speaking from the same place he was speaking from when he was around, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Sometimes people will say, well, I miss, I really wish I wish I'd you know, met Sid and so on, which would be nice because he had a great sense of humor he was fun to be with. But at the heart of it, they can have that experience because if you listen to those recordings or you read those books with a quiet mind, you're listening to somebody speaking or writing from that space, from that wisdom. And that elevates your chances of having an insight from within yourself. So that's really at the heart of how we share and how we work is that, that idea of people having their own insights. And while I have an immense respect for everybody out there teaching this, uh, whether it's Jan or I or anybody else, nobody, can talk about that experience that Sid had like Sid. Of course not. So we do, we do like with every client we work with, we basically insist that they listen to those materials. Right. Okay. And you did that with me. I remember Yeah. when I worked with you, that was great. Yeah. And Bill Pettit, for instance, as a, as a super highly qualified psychiatrist, I mean, Bill Pettit, Dr. Pettit has more qualifications than any psychiatrist I've ever heard of. <laughs> but he insists that new clients listen to those materials before they start working with them. And I think that's phenomenal. I think that's an indicator of what we were just talking about. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I was going to come on to the subject of relationships. Sure. Because I know that you you talk about reception, relationships. Um with people I've talked to, like particularly like Jamie, for instance, I was wondering if you could address that now. Yeah, I mean, do you want to um, just talk generally about relationships, or do you want to talk about um, more intimate relationships? Like, what would you like to talk about? Well, I'm thinking at the moment in the situation we have with the pandemic, as people's personal intimate relationships are being highly strained by living in the same house. So yes. maybe if you could talk to that, actually, that would be great. Okay. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. And when I'll use this as an example to start, we often have couples come to do uh, couples retreats with us, mm -hmm. just individual couples one at a time here on Salt Spring Island. And I know this is true of other really great three principles therapists too, is when they first come here, very, very, I mean, other than greeting them and maybe having a dinner before we start our, our week's work, we very seldom work with them together to begin with. We, Jan and I, we take one off in one direction, one off in another. And the reason for doing that is pretty basic. When people like living in a home together during COVID or as couples, they have a history of habits together. Mm. And just to put it in kind of blatant terms, you know, I say this, you do that, you do that, I say this, uh, you, you, I, I make my, I have my feelings hurt and I, I don't talk to you or we, we have all this back and forth or, I, you know, you think you're smarter than me. It's just, there's all kinds of things that go on between people, right? And so when people first come, we don't want to get into that. Again, that idea that we want to talk beyond the mass to the health in the person. So we found working with couples, for instance, that it's better uh, to take them separately and just really talk from the heart with each one. Because what I've seen over and over again is that when one person shifts to higher level of understanding, the entire relationship has changed immediately. Immediately. Yeah. Because one person is now pulled out of the back and forth and is seeing at a deeper level, seeing the innocence of the other person and seeing the innocence of themselves. 
And if you want to look at it this way, that's essentially what happened with Jan and I when we first came across the principles. Okay, we, we were in trouble with our marriage. It was really in bad shape. It probably wouldn't have lasted much longer before we met Sid. Uh, we couldn't be in a room together without arguing. You say this, I do that, all of that, you know. And we couldn't get out of it. We, we, we'd been stuck in, it, stuck in it for a couple of years and we were in bad shape. And then out of nowhere, Jan accidentally ended up in Sid's living room with some friends. She was with some friends and they were, she didn't know who, well, we'd heard vague rumors about Sid on the islands that some welder had become enlightened. And we like, <laughs> I just blew that off completely, right? But she ended up in Sid's living room. And there was, as she recalls it, I think there was maybe eight people there, some other couples and just the people that, the friends that, the mutual friends that Jan was with. And uh, sometime I'll let Jan tell that story, but essentially she started listening. Sid was, first of all, when, when she was in this room, she was very shy and not saying anything. And most of the talk was just normal social chit chat. Right? And all of a sudden Sid started talking in a, this completely different way. And he basically said something to the effect, if you could see what a beautiful person you really are on the inside, your problems would all go away. Right? Now, Jan heard that, I mean, big time. The way she describes it is suddenly she saw her life stretched out before her and she knew it was going to be beautiful, right? Yeah. And she just, she'd walked in there insecure, really worried about her marriage, really upset about everything, feeling broken. And she walked out of that house just feeling like a totally different person, which has gone on from that point to 47 years later. Right? Mm -hmm. So when she came home from that, this was, we were living on a smaller island than Salt Spring. So she had to take a ferry to get home. And she came in the house and started telling me about, I met this guy and she started telling me, we really don't, we really don't have problems. It's really just thought. <laughs> and my reaction was, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't have it. And we, we I ended up getting angry and, and resisting. But Jan, I would say, I think it was maybe three or four days kept trying to tell me about it. And the more she tried to tell me about it, the angrier I got. Right? And the way she tells it is one day she was looking at me and she, she realized she did what Sid says. She looked beyond the mask and she realized that I was I was fine. I was going to be fine. And she stopped trying to convince me in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. She stopped mentioning it totally. But as I was saying about when one person changes in a relationship, at first it was so confusing because I, I, this is hindsight. I would try to draw Jan into our old arguments where I kind of understood what was going on, right? Like the old, I would the way I put it before is like I try to get a hold of the old handles in our relationship, but they were gone. I could wow. every once in a while for two or three minutes, I could get Jan upset. I could throw out some argument we've we've had many times, and she'd start to get upset. But I'd always see that moment when she would pull back and her face would soften, and, and you know she just would say, "I'm going for a walk," or "Would you like a cup of tea?" And I would just be like so frustrated. Right? And when she stopped trying to convince me, I think that was a big turning point. She never said anything, but I felt it, you know? So that left me alone in my world, my negative world, looking at her positive world. Right? Oh, yeah. And at, at first I thought, this will go away. It'll change. She'll be back to her old self. But after like a week or so, I began to realize that Jan's change was permanent and sustainable that something really deep had happened and she wasn't coming back the way that I knew her, right? And what that did for me is at first it made me really depressed, right? I thought, well, not, now I have to leave, my wife's happy all the time, <laughs> can't, can't have that. But what, all joking aside, what came out of that permanent change in Jan was my confusion morphed into curiosity. Like, like, what is this? Oh. What is this? You know? And I finally started to listen. And then had my own insights. And one in particular, the one that 
set in, in motion profound change for me is these few weeks have gone by and I was, it was really strange because after a couple of weeks, our relationship just improved. It just, it just got better. The arguing went away. And when I look back on it now, it's still puzzling because I don't remember saying, thinking, well, I should stop doing this or Jan should stop doing that or we shouldn't be this way or we should, it just went away. Mm -hmm. And, and there was this really nice feeling in spite of me still being in my head about things, right? And then one day, early morning, and I, by now I had listened to Sid a couple of times and, you know, it's like feeling a little bit better and everything. Uh, but one morning I was sitting on the couch reading early morning, like 6.30 or so, because our son was a little three or two and a half, three year old at the time. And he was up early and I was sitting on the couch and Jan was on the floor playing with our son. And the morning light was coming in the window at a really steep angle and was shining in their hair. And it caught my attention. And I was looking at them and this feeling just, whoosh, just rushed in. And I just filled up, you know. And I'm looking at them and I remember thinking, I distinctly remember thinking, all I have to do is surrender. And as soon as I thought that, everything changed. My whole view of life, our marriage, that was the beginning of, that's why I'm sitting here now, mm -hmm. from that moment. Now, I accepted that feeling and I went with it, but I really didn't understand what happened in that moment till maybe, maybe even a year later, maybe more. And what it was, was that moment when I was looking at them, was my first experience of what Sid would refer to as seeing. Seeing. See, I saw Jan and Peter. I saw them without all of my thinking about them, without all of the past, with all, I saw them in that moment. And it filled me with a feeling of love. Right? Yeah. And in that seeing, I, at the same time, I instinctively understood that the rest was just thought. Yeah. So it, it ended all of that stuff in our marriage forever. I mean, we've been married for 51 years now and it's never come back, you know? Oh yeah, we have our moments when we get on each other's nerves now, <laughs> but not much, not much. And that's certainly nothing like the way, oh my God, I mean, I, I can't imagine how we were, but that was my first moment of actually seeing, you know, when Sid says in his talks, he says, there's seeing and there's seeing, <laughs> hearing and there's hearing. Yes. Well, for me, that was my first real experience of seeing. I saw beyond my belief system about Jan and his son. I saw beyond my beliefs about how, what life was in that moment. I saw them. So in relationships, when people are living with each other, all it would take is one person really listening and getting quiet and having some insights to change whatever's going on in the relationship. And, and we, we have clients now who are living through the COVID thing who are experiencing that. So, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just thinking they probably experience it in a very different way, aren't they? From they are. I mean, some people have called and said, you know, my kids are driving me crazy and stuff, and on our Skype talks. But you know, I, I usually say, well, let's talk about that later, and then we we go into that feeling, right? And we talk about what's really on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. They get an insight. They get that feeling. So, guess how they're going to be with their kids and their family after they've gotten that feeling right? right yeah so they're seeing for themselves they're learning to see for themselves and so they start to see their their children and, and their spouse without yeah. all that thinking going on yeah exactly 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 and yeah. you know it's, it's sort of like i i've said a few times through the years that discovering the principles and by that i mean discovering the ability to look inside mm -hmm is very much like falling in love. Like when you fall in love with somebody, when you first meet them, you don't care about their little habits. <laughs> you ignore them completely. You just yes. want that connection, right? Yeah. And so you're in that lovely feeling because you're not, and then you live together for a while and this little one bothers you and then that bothers you and then you're off and running, right? <laughs> and when you discover the principles like I did in that moment that I described, it's really the same thing. You, you let go of that thinking and that beautiful feeling fills you. And that's, that feeling is wisdom. 
that feeling is knowledge. It is knowledge. You know, when people get puzzled when Sid said there's information, so many times you would say there's information in a yeah. feeling. Well, if you look at that experience that I've described with Jan and Peter, yeah. the information was vast. It was, this is who these people really are. This is what life really is. And this is what all this stuff is. That's vast, vast knowledge, right? Enough to change your life forever. Yeah, and compared to what you get from the thinking, it, it's, it yeah. doesn't compare at all, does it? It is, as you say, it's vast. Yeah, and, and it's so amazing because it's not coming from anybody else. That moment is yours when you see that. Of course. Right? So it's your knowledge. It's not yeah. something you practice or structure or ritual or, or, you know, it's none of that. It's what you see, and that's what really counts. That's amazing. That's lovely. I love that. I love it. So I was going to ask you, has your work changed from pre-COVID to post-COVID or during COVID? Or has it just changed, stayed much the same? You know, it's kind of both. It's, it, it is much the same in the sense that we take the same approach with everybody. and we yeah. talk about everybody. But I think there is something to the fact that everybody's a little quieter right now, including mm -hmm. us. And so it seems like it's going deeper as a result of, of COVID. You know? oh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, it's not that people don't bring up, you know, like we know people have lost people and stuff. So there are, there is that side of it, you know, but on the other hand, there's, there's a deepening. I think that there's some real benefits to all of this for all of us to kind of have a reset, you know, mm. and, and the quiet that it provides, I think is helpful in that direction. Like I, I have a client, um, she, uh, she works in a very, you know, for, huge Fortune 500 company, and she's very successful. But she had a lot of paranoia about what her bosses thought of her and employees thought of her. And she would lose sleep thinking about what people thought of her at work. And she could always come home from work stressed out. Mm -hmm. So COVID comes along, and she can't go into work. And she, I, we had a scheduled meeting, and... As soon as I saw her, I knew something was different. She just looked so different. She looked so soft and relaxed, actually like you do right now. And I, I was curious. I said, what's going on? She said, I have this amazing insight. I said, what's that? She said, I've just been feeling really, really good. And she said, I know part of it is that I'm, I'm listening and I'm going inside. She said, but another part of it is, now that I'm not going into work, I haven't been thinking about what people think of me all the time, right? Yeah. And I've realized that it that it, that's up to me. That's down to me. That anywhere I work is going to be the same. It's Absolutely, true. yeah. But just having a break from not going in gave her just enough room to have an insight about that. <clears throat> so that was really neat. So that's that's part of the COVID thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other thing that I hear a lot, and I love it, and I can see it with my daughter and son-in-law is people are talking about all the problems of children not being able to go back to school and getting homeschooled and all this kind of stuff. But the flip side of that is, is there are a lot of kids who never had any time with their parents. Yeah. Except for, you know, dinner time and an hour before bed, most of their lives. And now they've got all this time with their parents. Like my grandkids are loving it. I mean, I, I know they would like to be at school, but they're loving this time with their mom and dad, you know? And their mom and dad are wise enough to take advantage of it, you know. And so there's there's two sides to it. There there's definitely problems. Obviously, kids should be in school if they could, but it doesn't mean that they're not benefits as well if people can see it. It's partly about that thing of framing it differently, isn't it? It it's going from some, the paranoia to this is an opportunity. Yeah. Again, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, again, it's it's how we think about things. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and like everything can present an opportunity, you know, I mean, Sid often said in many of his talks, he would say that life is a contact sport, like you're going to get knocked down. And that's true. No matter what you know, that's true. Mm. But it's how you look at it and where you're looking at that whole experience from, you know, like 
I see people now, I talk to clients who are clearly growing at a faster pace than they were before COVID. COVID. You know? Yep. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's not a great thing. It's, it's part of the contact sport thing, but there's also an amazing side to it. You know, and I, and I think for society, this is, this is not three principles. This is Chip Chipman's prognosticating. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there are going to be benefits for society. You know, I, I think that people are really having a look at their priorities and, and about kind of the rat race thing and everything. I think yeah. people are really getting another look at what life really is and what's really important to them. You know? it's, it actually makes it much clearer, doesn't it? I think it does. Yeah. Because you start to realize what you're missing and what you're happy for, what you're pleased about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's interesting. And I think we mentioned earlier about grandchildren that you can't see your grandchildren in person. You can't hug them. Yeah. But you have more time to actually talk to them on, on Zoom or whatever or Skype. Because, it's true. And, and yeah. we've actually had deeper visits with our two grandsons than we've ever had. Yeah. Like when we go, when we could go visit them. It's rah, rah. And we're having a good time. We go to the park and go to the skate park and ride by. And it's all great. But now we've got these, like the two grandsons, one's 10 and, and, and one's seven or eight. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they call us now and they want to talk. Yes. They want to tell us about their life and what they're doing. And you know, that never happened before, you know, we had a good time with them and it was great to have the hugs, but now there's a new element where they really want to talk to us. And, and like um, the 10 year old called us last night and we talked for about 45 minutes and he showed us all of his new things that he's doing and things that he's reading. And you know, you can't knock that. That's no, you that's, can't. And for a 10 year old to speak for 45 minutes on the phone to his grand grandparents, that's quite I, something. I know it. That never happened before. Be like, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Grandma and Grandpa. We're going to go play video games. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but they, yeah. they're, seeking out, they're seeking out the connection now. Yeah. Because their lives have slowed down too. You know? So it's, it's fascinating times. It really is. It is, isn't it? Um, actually, talking about parents and grandparents. So I'm going to go away from that and, and talk about the kind of environments you've worked in, Chip, or you're going to talk about it, I'm not. <laughs> um, so prisons, corporate boardrooms, and so on. How does your ch work change from one environment to the next? Yeah, I, I was trying to think, as you said that, um, at its essence, it really doesn't change. Ah, oh, okay. What changes is the vocabulary. Oh, yes, of course. And that comes through listening, right? Like if we're in a corporate boardroom or we're working with a senior management team, we're listening for what they are concerned about at the moment, which when it starts out, usually starts out something about the business or having uh, an inability to communicate well with staff or whatever, you know. And we end up talking. Um, I only have one cure for all of that when I talk in business, and that was state of mind predicts everything. Mm -hmm. You have a quiet, positive state of mind you you listen more carefully you're more respectful in your relationships you think more clearly you don't overanalyze things and so we'll start out there inevitably inevitably i can't think of one time when we worked in business when eventually they start asking about their personal relationships right and so we end up we always end up talking in business about personal relationships but then they if somebody has an insight about how they operate in a relationship, mm. it won't be just about the relationship they're thinking about. It'll generalize. And so it'll affect mm. all of their relationships, including the relationships in the workplace. Right? Yeah. So we listen for the vocabulary. Like in business, people would often talk about, we're not hearing each other. We have the silo effect where departments kind of operate on their own in different levels mm -hmm. of the business don't hear each other and so on. And so, we all end up talking about how do you reconnect? I, I, I used to have some buzzwords for it. We would talk about positive re-engagement. And then we would talk about state of mind, listening, 
uh, seeing the innocence of people, all the same stuff we talk about with everybody. Right? But the vocabulary gave them a chance to bring their thinking around to it. So you kind of start with their vocabulary and then you move into your own vocabulary. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair way to put it. You, you, you're listening for, for two things. One, for what they see and they're concerned about in their world, yeah. but also their wisdom. Yeah, and sure. When you're first listening, you hear some amazingly wise things from people and you can point that out. You can, you can talk about that. You can say, what was that you just said? about you've, you've learned to sit down with people and listen a little longer, whatever, you know. And so that listening gives you both the vocabulary that they're comfortable with. In business, it's different than in a rehab center and it's different than in a prison, right? But the message is the same, you know, like when we worked with inmates in the prison system, we did that for over three years and we did it for two nights a week, two hours a night for three years and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So the vocabulary there is, you know, I'm a broken person, my life's a mess, I've lost my kids to the state, on and on. So that's their vocabulary, that's where they're starting out. But in that, you'll hear some wisdom, you'll hear the fact that they've used courage, right? Mm -hmm. And then we can start talking about our experience, tell our story, and they begin to relate to it. They begin to see that when we tell our story that we saw the influence of thinking in creating our negativity and our insecurity and our near divorce and so on. And in that story, they begin to see that their own thinking has a role in the world that they've ended up in right? and that they have the power to change that thinking. We would be saying pretty much the same thing in a corporate boardroom. It's just the lead in and the listening and listening for their wisdom is really, I can't say that enough. Like when we first listened to inmates, we would hear amazing levels of wisdom, of moments of courage when they're totally lost and somehow found a way to step up and, and, and make things better, you know? And we would always point to that, that we're talking about something you already have. Yeah. And what you just said proves to me that you already have. Yeah. And they know that, they get that, right? You know? So it's really, and again, with addictions, you know, everybody, they all want to talk about addictions. And I, I laugh because we spent years working with rehab centers and spent very little time, if hardly any at all, talking about addiction. That's fascinating. We listened, you know, mm. and we address it slightly, but what we really would address was the reality that lay within them was in all three of those environments, for instance, we'd always get to the point of saying that the true self has never been damaged, can never be damaged, will never be damaged, because it's really not of this world. It's spiritual in nature. Yeah. And it's, it's the seed of wisdom. And whatever your reality is and what you want to do in that reality has more to do with where you're looking at it from than what's going on. And as your level of consciousness rises, whether you're an inmate or an executive or an addict, as your level of consciousness rises, you see and understand at a deeper and deeper level. So in that sense, it really is all the same. Because it's the same humanity underneath, isn't it? We Absolutely. are all the same at root. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Everybody plays the same game. Yeah. There may be different words and different things in it, but it's still essentially the same game. And that's really important to remember. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. I realize we've not got much time left. Do you feel, Chip, that you have enough time to talk about your dad, or is it going to be rushing things too much? No, I mean, we've got about 10 minutes. I think so. I can give the slightly abridged version. Okay. <laughs> well, I love this story. It's when I tell quite a few of my my own clients and patients because I find it really inspiring. So if you could sure. talk to our listeners. Well, first of all, let me just say this. Through all the years that I've been around this, I've seen and witnessed some amazing changes in people, right? But before this story, mm -hmm. the one person on this planet I couldn't imagine changing was my father. That was so far beyond, no matter what great things I saw, 
and myself and Sid and all the people. I, I, I just couldn't fathom that. Um, just as briefly as I can, um, I was the oldest of 11 kids. I have six brothers and four sisters. And my dad was pretty severe alcoholic and at times could be violent. Right? He had a rage within him that was unbelievable. Right? And as the oldest son, um, just to say a little bit, when I got to be 13 or 14, I, I really I felt responsible for protecting my mother and my brothers and sisters. So I would get into it with my father. In fact, that's how I left home at 17. It's after a big physical encounter with my father. And uh, went on, left home, met Jan, went through all of our stuff with our marriage, met Sid, started to feel better about life. And uh, in the very beginning, when I would listen to Sid, there was one thing that really bothered me when he talked is he often talked about forgiveness, the power and the value of forgiveness. And so um, I would just, I would just, I remember just, I, I can remember my thoughts clearly. You don't know what I've seen, so you can't. There are some things that are unforgivable. Mm. And I truly felt that even after my life changed. And so one night I, I heard Sid talk and he started going on about forgiveness again. And I walked out, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. You know, I got I got upset and he called me the next day he said what's with you what's that what's up and I said you know Sid it's when you talk about forgiveness and he asked me well why you know and I said basically the thing was you don't know what I've seen he said well come over you know so I went over to his house and sat down and we had a cup of tea and he said okay this was one of maybe two or three times in 40 some years that he would actually address the specifics of anything in my life oh wow you know, he said, so tell me about it. So I told him like the worst two or three stories I could remember, you know, and it, I could see it really affected him. You know, he was, he was touched. He was emotional. Right. So it got quiet after I told him the stories and he goes, he goes, you know, Chip, your father must have really been suffering to have done those things. And I just freaked out. I just said, I gotta go. I just couldn't, I couldn't handle that. Right. So I forget it was that night or a couple nights later, I was laying in bed and I was thinking about some cruel things, mean things I'd said to Jan before I changed when we were arguing and fighting all the time. And uh, I just, you know, that feeling is cringe, like, oh God, I wish I could go back in time and take that back, right? And then I had this insight that belonged to this world over here. You don't live in that world anymore. You live in, in a completely different world where that's totally irrelevant. Mm. And I just felt this feeling of peace wash over me. And I, I fell asleep and I slept for like 10, 11 hours, which was really not like me. And when I, when I woke up, I felt lighter. I felt completely different, but I couldn't get my finger on it. A couple of weeks later, same thing. I'm laying in bed, Jan's asleep. And for whatever reason, I started thinking about my dad. And I went right back to our last encounter and I got physically sick thinking about it. I was so angry and full of hate. And it, it really shocked me to feel those feelings again. And then I had an insight, and the insight was really simple. My father was living in a world that was handed to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't know there was anything outside of that world. And I just happened to be born in his house. It's got nothing to do with me. And I just felt this relief. I mean, that's the only word I can really use. It's just profound relief. And I remember I started to tear up at just the relief. And then the next thing I, that happened just really shocked me. I just felt this, I just felt this love and compassion for my dad. And I hadn't felt that. I had never felt anything but hate for him for many, many decades, literally decades. And again, I, I just felt completely peaceful. And I, again, I slept for 10 or 11 hours. And when I woke, I felt completely different. But this time I had an understanding. I had an insight. Mm -hmm. There was, can you imagine how much thought and ways of interacting in the world revolved around that relationship for me? Yeah. Volumes and volumes mm -hmm. and volumes. And the reason I felt light is it had all fallen away. It no, it no longer mattered. And it's never mattered since. Mm -hmm. So... 
I decided that I would contact my father. I hadn't spoken to him probably in like 12 years or something. I'd never let him meet our kids. He'd never met our kids. And so Jan and I started calling him. And he was, he was very confused as to why we would call. You know, he didn't know how to talk to us. Sometimes he'd, he, he'd still be intoxicated, right? Mm -hmm. Other times he wasn't, but we just kept calling him, mm -hmm. like at least once a week. And over time, it got better. He, he wouldn't talk about anything serious, but he would, you know, talk about painting the house or going to the hockey game or whatever. But there was a connection, right? Yeah. And so I was giving a talk in St. Petersburg, Florida, to a large room full, mostly therapists and psychologists, psychiatrists, and I was doing the keynote. And I went really well, and I was walking down from the podium, and I looked across the room at Jan, and as soon as I looked at her, I knew something was wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. So I made my way through the crowd. I said, what's going on? She said, your father apparently is dying, and he wants to see you. And I said, oh, and you know how the kind of reaction you would have. Oh, you know. Okay. And um, Jan was on the ball because he'd already bought me tickets to fly up to Canada from Florida to see my dad. So I don't think it was three or four hours later, I was on a plane flying north and arrived and went to the hospital. And uh, the scene was totally chaotic. There was maybe six or seven of my siblings there in this waiting room, all arguing, all fighting, all upset. You know, there was about a 25 year old social worker <laughs> trying to settle it. Down. And I remember thinking, buddy, that ain't going to work, <laughs> you know. And I just, I, I won't say what I said, but I just yelled. I said, I, I don't want to hear this. Let's just be quiet, you know. And if the old man regains consciousness, I want to see him. And he's asked to see me, and I'm going to do it alone. And somebody started arguing with me. I said, oh, you know, no. And I wasn't being nice, believe me. I was just mm -hmm. in a really, by then I was in a really low mood. I'd been rehearsing all the way up on the plane. I'd been rehearsing in my head what I was going to say to my dad and what he should say to me. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Mm -hmm. So finally the doctor came and said, no, somebody can see Mr. Chipman if you want now, he's partially conscious, you know? So I, I walked down the, the hallway in the hospital with the doctor and, and I, at this point, I still don't even know what he's dying from because my family, this was really bad at staying in touch. So I asked the doctor and he goes, well, he has asbestosis, uh, mesothelioma mm, yeah. asbestos in his lungs. He, um, his stomach is shriveled up because he hasn't eaten in days. He has alcohol poisoning. And he's going, the list is like, <laughs> I'm like, holy mackerel. And then he says, and you know, he had that um, triple bypass. And I go, what? Nobody told me about it. Mm -hmm. Doctor said, yeah, he had a triple bypass about three weeks ago. And instead of going home and doing the therapy, he went home and sat on the couch drinking whiskey. And I said, oh my God. I said, so which one of them is killing him? He said, well, actually, none of them in particular. It's actually pneumonia now. He's so low. Yeah. All right. Oh, he's got him. Okay. So then we arrive at the ICU. And the doctor pushes the door open for me. And I walk in. The door closes behind me. And I realize the doctor hasn't come in. And I'm looking at this soul, mm -hmm. this bed. Now, I haven't, at this point, I haven't seen my father in many years. And he was... A strong strapping construction worker kind of guy oil refinery worker right. what i'm seeing is this skeleton on the bed with hardly any just skin and bones and all this rehearsing was going on in my head but the second i looked at his face it was gone mm -hmm. there was this amazing quiet in the room now this is just my experience but the way i felt like you know, poof it felt like the light in the room changed mm -hmm. and my head was totally clear and I looked down at his face and I could see that he recognized me and what came off out of my mouth shocked me I mean honestly I, I was so surprised I looked down at this man and it was interesting because when that happened when that the thought cleared it really became irrelevant that this was my father there was just this soul on his way out you know so I looked down at him and what came out of my mouth just really did shock me. I said, do you want to get out of here? I remember thinking, what the hell are you saying <laughs> to this dying man? Do you want to get out of here? And he looked puzzled, but then he nodded. You know, I said, well, you know all that guilt and shame that you feel right now for the way you lived your life and the way you treated mom and the family and 
tears started to roll down the side of his face. So I knew that was true. I said, you have to realize that you were living in a world that was handed to you. And you didn't know there was any world beyond that. You were lost, you know. And if you'd have known better, you would have done better. And he wept some more. And then this memory came to me and I just said, when I was a kid, you used to talk about leaving Newfoundland where we lived as where I was born mm -hmm. to find a new life in Western Canada. I said, do you remember that? He, I said, whenever you told stories about that, he would just light up. You love telling us stories about moving to the West and, and finding a new life. And everything. Do you remember that feeling? Do you remember the feeling? And he nodded. You know, I said, well, here's the thing. If you want to get out of here, you have, let, you have to let go of all the guilt and the shame. And you have to grab on to the feeling that you had on that train to go west. And if you do, we'll see what happens. And he passed out. He lost consciousness. And I went, oh, my God, what did I just say to a dying man? You know, like, and I went down the hallway. This shows how long ago it was to a payphone and phone Jan in Florida yeah. and told her what I'd said. And I was like, I was worried about what I'd said. You know, My thinking had come in trying to analyze what had mm -hmm. happened. And Jan said, that's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And I settled down and Jan said, you know, you know that insurance video we took for the house and there's some shots of the kids in it. She said, I'm going to FedEx it up to you, which she did. And it came in a couple of days later because my dad had never seen his, my kids, he'd seen his other grandchildren from my brothers and sisters, but he never really seen my kids except for when they were first born babies. Right? So he regained consciousness a little bit the next day and we went in to see him and I said, do you want to meet your grandkids? And he kind of lit up. I said, they're not here, but I've got this video, right? And we'd gotten permission from the doctor to put the TV at the end of the bed. Yeah. And so we put on this video and it's like, it's an insurance video. So here's the VCR. Here's the television in the bedroom. Here's the television in the living room. Here's the tape deck. Here's the refrigerator. <laughs> and then out in the garage, my son was 16 at the time. And we'd found, this probably won't resonate so much in Europe, but we'd found this American muscle car, this American hot rod. Yeah. For him to fix up, right? All right. And he and I had been restoring it. And we had yeah. just got the engine to run. It had no mufflers on it. No, uh, I think, I forget what you call them in Europe, but anyway, it was super noisy. Anyway, I shine the camera on my son who's leaning over the engine in the garage. Mm -hmm. Got no shirt on. He's super handsome, 16. <laughs> he's got his hand over the engine, <clears throat> operating the carburetor, making it roar like crazy. <laughs> Back with his big grin on his face, right? <laughs> and, uh, my dad looked at that and he, I saw the first time I'd seen him smile, he just smiled, you know. And then inside it was, you know, here's this, here's that. And then there was this amazing shot of my daughter in the backyard who would have been like 11 at the time, maybe, maybe 12. And she's throwing the Frisbee for the, she has a sundress on, this is in Florida. Mm -hmm. She's throwing the Frisbee for the dog and the sun is shining in her hair. It's just a beautiful, beautiful shot. And my father just started to, to weep and actually choke. Oh. And, uh, you know, it was just, he was so emotional. And the doctor said, no, no, that's too much. Everybody out. Because there were a couple of my brothers and sisters and myself. And it's the first word I heard out of my father through this whole thing. He goes, no, clear as could be. And the doctor's like, what? <laughs> he wanted to watch the rest of the video. He wanted to see it again. Right? And so he did. And what happened was... Um, he hung in there and I really, I had to fly home. I couldn't stay there. Mm -hmm. Kept hanging in there, but he survived. Yeah. And he lived another seven years and he became a totally, absolutely, totally different person. He never took another drink. Yeah. He actually kept beer in his refrigerator for his buddies that came over. <laughs> he never drank. Wow. He never went to AA or anything. He just quit after a lifetime. God, God knows 40 years at least of being an alcoholic started calling my kids every week. How's school? And he never talked to me about school the whole time I grew up. <laughs> he just became this really gentle, loving person, you know? 
And we never talked about, he would talk to Jan about what happened in the hospital. All right. Told her he was grateful and kind of what happened the way he saw it, but he couldn't use too macho to talk to me about it. But that was, <laughs> he knew I'd hear about it from Jan, right? Yeah. We just became really good friends. And uh, the following summer, Jan and I bought a new car and uh, in Florida and we loaded up and drove up to Canada and my kids got to meet their grandfather. And we were out at a cottage on the lake that my brother had. And, you know, he was a, he was a real leader. He was a union leader and he had all these great stories of strikes and <laughs> union busting and all this. And my kids just, they just loved it. They apps, they just sat at his feet listening to these stories. Right. And uh, seven years later, he called me and he said, uh, I'm having another surgery tomorrow. I said, I'll fly up. I'll come up and see you. He said, no, don't. He said, I'm not going to come out of it. And I, what? I said, sure you will, Dad. Sure. He says, he said, no. He said, I'm tired. I'm ready and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And he went into surgery and he died. And actually, that's a lovely story about coming to death with that sort of composure about it and not being frightened of it. He was. He, he was so grateful for those last seven years of yeah. his life. Because I think his life had been a terror long before I was born even. Like I, I actually at his funeral I did the um the eulogy and one of my aunts came up and told me what he'd been through as a kid. I never oh, I, right. you know. And he'd been through hell as a child, you know. And so when that happened, even to this day, it's so hard for me to imagine that that actually happened, that my father heard something at a deeper level. And he, what he heard really was that he was psychologically innocent and there was something in him that wasn't broken. Yes. And yeah, that is such a beautiful story trip. I'd just love to hear you tell it again. That was fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you. You do a terrific interview. This has really been nice. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to wind it up now because I'm, I've got a call and then, <laughs> Oh, two minutes ago. <laughs> uh -oh. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it's been great. It's been such a good time. Um, well, if there's anything else, I, I was going to ask you about contact details, but I can put them in, into print. That's not a problem. If people want to contact you, just to make sure. an email address, is that okay? That email address is fine. Great. Okay. Advantageconsult.com, you can put that up. Brilliant. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. This has been really amazing. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed it, Sarah. really enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah, so. me too. Oh, have a great evening. All right, love. Bye-bye. Okay, take care. Bye.